read uh, a verse of scripture. I'd like to ask you to uh, keep your Bibles handy, as I'll be having you turn to several other verses of scripture in just a little bit. Psalm 8. And we'll look at verse number 3. Psalm 8 and verse number 3. I ask you to settle down now. I don't have any more talking, any more moving around. Uh, so we can everybody can hear and listen to the Scripture tonight. Psalm 8 and verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now look back at verse number three tonight, and there's a word there in verse three that I want to preach about tonight, and um, the word is the fingers, God's fingers. I'm going to bring you a message on the subject, the fingers of God. God has fingers. Do you know that? Some people think God is, looks like Casper, that, they, that he's just like a, some, a veil sheet you can see through. According to the Bible, it's very clear that God has fingers, and God can write. God can write and God does write. And we're going to look at tonight how God writes and what God writes and what man's response is to what God writes. Whatever God writes is creative. Everything God writes is life-giving. But if rejected, it winds up destroying the person who rejects it. The big debate among Christians now and humans is whether or not we actually have something in our possession that God wrote. God, does God write? Can God write? And if He can, and if He does, do we have it? That's the debate among Christians tonight. First of all, I want to look at His fingers tonight. Psalm 8, 3 there, the Bible said that His fingers made the stars. His fingers made the stars. He uh, uh, made some, created some, I reckon, and He flung them into space with His fingers. You think about that. Of all the stars in the known universe, God made them with His fingers. It'd be just like me and you tinkering around in a sand pile, just moving around here and scooping up a little bit here and moving over there. He didn't even have to use His arms or His legs, just His fingers. And went plunk and flung out all the stars in this universe. Somebody said one time that Sir Isaac Newton had a scale model replica of the solar system sitting on his desk. A scientist came in one day. They had the, he had the sun, the moon, and the planets all lined up proportionately, you know, exact size for, on a scale uh, there on his desk. Somebody come in they said, uh, oh, that's the most amazing, most beautiful replica of the universe of, or solar system I've ever seen. Who made that for you? And Sir Isaac Newton said, nobody made it. He said, oh, come on now, don't act silly. Who made that for you? He said, nobody made it. He said, now, don't give me those foolish answers. I mean, it didn't just pop out of nowhere. Somebody had to make that thing. It's perfect scale. And, and Sir Isaac Newton said, well, you scientists believe that the real thing got here by itself, by accident with nobody making it. Then what's the big deal about this one here popping up on my desk? Amen? Well, uh, that just shows you how foolish it is not to believe that God created the solar system with His fingers. Now let me show you something tonight. Let's, let's uh, take one page of your Bible like this. Everybody take one page of your Bible and hold it up like that right there. Now I want you to hold your thumb on one side of it, your finger on the other side where you can feel your thumb and your finger there. You see how thin that piece of paper is? Now hold it right there a second. Let's tonight let that distance, the thickness of that page, we're going to let it represent the distance between earth and the sun. 93 million miles, they say. Now listen, let's say that piece of paper, the thickness of that paper now represents uh, 93 million miles, okay? Let's see what God can do with His fingers. If that the thickness of that paper represents a distance of 93 
three million miles, do you know how far it would be to the nearest star? To the nearest star would be 71 foot thick of paper. Now, that piece of paper you have in your hand represents 93 million miles. To the nearest star, you'd have to have a piece of paper as thick as about right from right here, about 75 feet from here to the back wall uh, where you put folks are sitting on the back. That's how far it would be to the nearest star. Think about what God did with His fingers. Amen? They said the diameter of the galaxy would be 310 miles of paper. When one piece of paper represents 93 million miles, the diameter of the galaxy would be represented by 310 miles of paper. But the edge of our known universe would be 31 million miles of paper. That, as they say out in the country, brother, is a fur piece. Amen? 31 million miles thick of paper, and the Bible said God did it with His fingers. I'm glad tonight that God made it that way. They say our sun would hold one million earths inside the sun. There are stars in our universe that would hold 500 million of our sun. I tell you, the same instrument that God used to make those galaxies of millions and billions of miles and millions of stars and planets are the very same fingers that He used to write that Bible that we got in our laps and on this pulpit here tonight. What a book, folks. What a book. His fingers made the stars. Secondly tonight, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 8 and we'll notice what God made with His fingers. Exodus chapter number 8. Now here in the book of Exodus, you know the story, how that Moses is into it with Pharaoh here, and the Lord is performing His miracles and bringing the plagues on the land of Egypt. Here, God made lice from the dust of the earth. Now, hold your place there in Exodus chapter number 8. And in Exodus chapter 8, we see during these chap few chapters of the book of Exodus how that God is making miracles. The first miracle He told Moses, He said, Moses, you go in there in front of Pharaoh, you throw your rod down, that rod will turn into a serpent. And boy, He said, if they don't believe that, you can go on. Of course, they didn't. The second miracle was He turned the river in the blood where He stretched out His rod there and the water turned to blood. And the Egyptians duplicated some of these first miracles. The third miracle was the miracle of the frogs. Frogs in the kitchen. Frogs in the bed. Frogs in the baby's bed. Frogs in the refrigerator. Frogs in the oven. Frogs in the pots and pans. Every glass you picked up, instead of a, instead of a martini on the rocks, it was, I mean, Mountain Dew on the frogs, brother. I mean, it was everywhere. I mean, it was, I mean, it would make you sick. And brother, that was the next miracle. Then Pharaoh got right. He got right every time a plague come, you know. And uh, he asked Moses to take away the frogs. And the fourth miracle was getting rid of the frogs. You know, that was one of the miracles in the book of Exodus. Getting rid of the frogs. What they do with all them frogs? I mean, brother, they was all over the land of Egypt. You'd have had to have people with loaders and backhoes and everything else to come in there and scoop them things up, but God got rid of them. That was the fourth miracle. The fifth miracle is the one we're going to look at here tonight, and it was when, when God made the lice. God made the lice. Boy, I tell you, I could about handle them frogs better than I could them lice, couldn't you? My soul. Hey, how many of you have... No, I better not say that. I don't want to... I don't want anybody... But have you ever been around anybody who had a good old case of lice? I mean, we've seen them kids, I've seen them kids, man, sometimes. Them bus kids, a lot of times they'll come in and do it like this. And the next thing, little brothers are doing like this. And little sisters are doing like this. And they're going like, like that, boy. And I mean, you're scared. Oh, Lord, don't let the young'uns get around them. Uh, they've got lies. And you, can you imagine how that God, you know what God said there in the Bible? God said in the Bible that the Lord spoke the, the dust to the earth and He turned all the dust into life. Now you talk about some lies. Brother, what if God said, all right, every bit of dirt and marion turn into a lice? 
My soul. All over the dogs. All over the cats. I mean, in your bed sheet. Everybody, you talk about itching. They'd be kind of make... I feel something on my back right now. Seem like... I mean, oh, I can't stand the thoughts of them just being all over me like that. Lord in mercy. I, I just can't. I did... My back started itching the other day. I thought I was getting a chicken box because all the kids was getting them in school. But I tell you, that would be awful. But I want you to notice, when the Egyptians began to duplicate this miracle here in Exodus chapter number 8, we see what in verse said in verse number 18. Look at it. Genesis, I mean Exodus chapter 8 and verse 18. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, look at what they said, Hallelujah, this is the finger of God. Amen. They said, Pharaoh, we can't fake this. We can't duplicate this. They said, this is the fingers that put them stars out there in the universe and made the sun and the planet. This is the finger of God Almighty. Amen. Oh, we can't do it. We can't duplicate this miracle, Mr. Pharaoh. We just can't do it. It is the finger of God. Amen. You ever notice that? You say, now, preacher, why could they duplicate the frogs? Why could they duplicate the uh, the uh, water turning to blood? Why could they make their rod turn into a serpent? But when it come time to make the lies, they couldn't do it. I'll tell you why. Because the lies was made from the dust of the earth. That's the original creation that God made back here in the book of Genesis. The serpent was made from a rod. Something's already created. The blood and the water turned water is already there and just turned it into blood. But when it come to this miracle, God, they made it from the dust to the ground. And if they could have done that, then that meant that the devil could duplicate the original creation, which he can't do. They say, listen, the devil, the devil's going to have power to give life during tribulations. You know that? But he cannot create from the dust of the earth. Only God's fingers can do that. Just like he did back there in the book of Genesis when he made Adam from the dust of the earth. It takes God's fingers to do that. You say, well, they've discovered life and created life in the laboratory. No, all they've done is just fix something that God already had here. They didn't create nothing from the dust of the earth. Never have and never will. Only God Almighty can create from the dust of the earth. Only God can do that. It was the miracle of God. Have you ever thought about what would happen if the devil could counterfeit the original creation? He'd make some wild creatures, wouldn't he? But he couldn't counterfeit it. But let's look at number 3. Number 3, Deuteronomy chapter 9. And we'll see the next time the hands and fingers of God shows up. There was a great man in the Bible here named Moses who was up in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And without eating or drinking that miraculous fast that Moses went on, here in Deuteronomy chapter 9, we see what God done. While Moses was up there, God wrote something with his fingers. And Deuteronomy chapter number 9 and verse number 10. Moses didn't eat nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. And Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10 said, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written, Hallelujah, there it is again, with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. So we see that God wrote here again with His finger. Now let's refresh our minds for a minute. You remember that story? Moses has been up there in the, in the desert. He is up there fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Suddenly God begins to talk to him during some time during that time. And the Lord says, All right, Moses... I want you to get up. And the Lord goes like this. And He cuts out. I don't know how they're shaped. I know how they looked in the movie, you know. I reckon that's, that's close enough to like this, like an open book. And they were down like this across the bottom, come up like this, then went over like that, and then like a heart shape in the middle. And all of a sudden, God's finger come down from heaven. And He said, Moses, hear me. And it, you know, like it did on that, that, that Ten Commandments movie they made. Might have been like that. I don't know. But it went... And boy, it burned there. And inside that rock it said, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he went, Shh. And there went another one. 
God's finger chiseled out in those rocks the Ten Commandments. And then you know what? Moses got them up and he held them like this. And he said, Oh, this is the very words of God written with the finger of God. I believe tonight that our Bibles would mean a whole lot more to us tonight if we just realized that the finger of God Almighty, the finger of God wrote this book right here. Oh, teenagers, carry this book with you. Hold it under your arm. Be proud to hold the greatest book in the world. The finger of God wrote this book. You know what Moses did? He's walking around down there and he started to go back down and show them that brand new Bible he had. And all of a sudden he heard them down there screaming and hollering. And the Lord looked down and he said, they've forsaken me. Aaron built that cave while Moses up there. They couldn't wait 40 days on their plaster to get something from God before they backslid. Amen? They said, Aaron, make us gods. We've been used to Egypt where they can see their gods, where they can touch their gods. Make us a god that will go before us. And Aaron said, all right, everybody, take your earrings out. And brother, all them, them boys and women, all of them had earrings. You know where they got them earrings? Egypt. Amen. And brother, he said, get them out, throw them in here. And he melted them down. And they made a golden cave, and they began to dance around that thing, and they began to get, oh, 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 can't touch this. Oh, 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 bring it down. Oh, 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 that's what they did. Same old stuff. Same old stuff. That's what they did. They got down. They worshipped that golden calf. And Moses said, What in the world is that I hear? That's awfully sound I ever heard in my life. Where in the world they get speakers so loud? I can hear them all the way up here. And they said, Circuit City. And he said, Lord, have mercy. That ought to be against the law. And he said, It sounded like a war down there. And they said, No. The Lord said, I'm going to consume them. My wrath's going to wax hot, and I'll make of you a greater nation. Yeah. You know why? Because he could see what's going on, and Moses couldn't see what's going on. Right. Have you ever noticed how when God got mad at them people, Moses would take up for them? And when Moses got mad at them, God would take up for them? You ever notice that reading that scripture? Somebody said if Moses and God ever both got mad at the same time, there wouldn't have been a Jew left in that crowd. <laughs> He'd have killed them all. But as one of them's always taken up for it. And the Lord said, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses said, no, wait a minute, Lord, you can't do that. Because if you do that, all them people back in Israel, I mean, in Egypt, they're going to say, well, the Lord took them out there to kill them. He wasn't able to sustain them in the wilderness. Spare them, Lord. Spare them. And the Lord said, all right, boy. Boy, Moses come down through there. He's seen them people dancing around like that. He's seen them dancing with people they wasn't married to. I mean, he's seen them outfits they was wearing. He's seen that nudity. He's seen that flesh. And Moses, boy, he had a temper too, you know. And buddy, he took them to uh, those tables of stone and goes like that and throws them down off the mountain and busts them all to pieces. And brother, he went back. Uh, they said Moses the only man had ever broke all Ten Commandments at the same time. <laughs> Amen. Hey, he threw them down right there and brother broke all the Ten Commandments and he turned right around and went back up. He made... Oh, you know the story they gave him down there, don't you? William's doing worshiping that false god. Where'd that thing come from? And Aaron, the associate pastor, said... He said, Preacher... I, we was getting rid of our rings and everything, boiled them out, and, thought, and this cat just popped out of there. I mean, I mean, well, it's an '83 model, and we needed it. And I said, "Yeah, you're a foot. We needed it." Uh, he said, "No, I don't know how they had it." But anyway, Aaron said, "Here come this cat." And Moses said, "I tell you what, you people, are, you thirsty, ain't you?" And he ground that thing up and throwed it in the water and made them drink it. He said, "You like his gold so much? Have a little lemonade here." <laughs> And he, and he put that gold dust in that water and made them drink it, went back up on the mountain, and God wrote him another set. You know why I said all that? I said that to say this. Listen, that second set God wrote wasn't the originals, but they was inspired. Yeah. Amen. 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 Some people say only the original manuscripts are inspired. That's not a Bible doctrine. Hey, that second set was just as inspired as that first because the finger of God wrote those Ten Commandments. Amen? Boy, I'll tell you what, we see what God's fingers did. Number four, let's move along. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. We see the next time in the Bible 
the fingers of God show up here in the house of Belshazzar. Daniel chapter number 5. You know Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. Drank wine before the thousand. Everybody got drunk. Everybody was having a big time. And his wives and his princes and his concubines. Everybody was drinking. They got about three sheets in the wind. Going to have a big party that night. And boy, there was that Jerusalem. The king and his palace, they drank wine. Look at verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Notice how the fingers of God shows up again. And the Bible said in verse 5, In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints, uh, loins, uh, joints of his loins were loose and his knees smoked one against another. Now, I won't read all that story, but you know that great story here in Daniel chapter number 5. How that they planned this big party. And brother, the Bible said that he had all those people there. And all those people come to get drunk at this big party. And they had a candlestick over here. Didn't have electricity back then. So it'd be just like up on this big white wall right here. A candlestick was throwing light over against that, that, uh, that wall. And old Belshazzar started getting drunk. And they took them golden vessels that had been in the house of God. He said, pour me a little wine in here. And they poured him some wine. And he said, hey, toast to Belshazzar's kingdom. That'll never go down. Boy, they started killing that wine, drinking that stuff down through the air. And all of a sudden, they saw a fingers of a man's hand. It don't even say they saw a hand or a wrist. Maybe they did sell part of a hand. I don't know. But it says fingers. And it started writing something on the wall. And it wrote many, many tickle euphorism. And brother, they wrote on that wall. And old Belshazzar looked over there. Can you imagine that old heathen king as he looked over there and saw that hand writing deep down inside him? I bet he thought, uh Oh, I don't like... I can't read that. And it's in another language. But something tells me it's against me. It's, it's, it's natural for the natural man to notice that the Word of God's against him. That's why people, when they see a Gideon Bible in a motel, they say, hide that thing. Get it away from me. They don't even know what it says. But they know it's against them. The spirit that's in them automatically wants to get away from that Bible. You take a Bible in a prison. You take a Bible in a, in a pool hall. You take a Bible in a, anywhere where there's a lot of things going on and just wait and watch people's reaction. It's like, uh-oh, uh-oh, get that thing away from me. That's the way Bill says it is. He said, uh-oh, I don't like the looks of that. I don't know who's writing it and I don't know what it says. Hey, soothsayers, astrologers, come, tell me what it says. Tell me what it says. And the Bible said, somebody heard something going... And looked, and it was the king's knees. Can you imagine that? The big old king sitting up on his knees, just going pow, 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 pow. Just like that, pow, 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 pow. Just a knocking each other like that. He was so scared, his knees knocked. And the Bible said it was over against the candlestick. And God wrote that boy a message that night. Oh, by the way, you know them soothsayers and astrologers and the educated men of, of his kingdom couldn't read it? They had to get the man of God to read the Word of God. Hey, education don't make a man know the Bible. Education don't. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It takes a man of God to read the Word of God. I've known preachers that didn't have no formal education hardly at all. But buddy, when they, they got the Word of God and opened that thing up and the light of God shined on that thing. Let me show you something about this candlestick while we're here just a second. Did you know he wrote doom against the candlestick, the type of the Holy Spirit? The candlestick in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, you know what the candlestick did? Back there in the book of uh, Exodus, when God told Moses to make the tabernacle. When you come in the tabernacle, all is a picture of the Lord, His Word, and Jesus Christ, and His sacrifice, the labor where you was. 
the showbread, a picture of the Word of God that priest set out there fresh every single morning. And you know what? They said that candlestick would be over here and it would shine light on that showbread. It was dark inside the tabernacle and it took the candlestick to shed light on the showbread so the priest could cut it and eat it. Now, if the, ca- if the showbread is a picture of the Word of God and the candlestick is a picture of the Holy Ghost, that means it takes the Holy Ghost to illuminate and light up the Word of God. And you preachers will never learn no greater lesson than to realize when you get your Bible down and study it, it'll just be many, many, many tickle you pars and brother until the Holy Spirit of God shines light on that Scripture and then it just opens up like a big new wall and you just say, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. That's a dark book without the Holy Ghost shining on it. That's what's wrong with a lot of churches. They got the Word of God but no light shining on it. Let's look back in Exodus 25 just a second for a word of Scripture on this candlestick. Exodus chapter 25. I love that study there in the Exodus 25, 26, 27, 8, 9, all in there about the tabernacle and all those types. Now notice what he said here. Exodus 25 and verse number 3. Exodus 25 and verse number 3. And this shall is the offering which ye shall take of them gold, silver, brass. Blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, and verse number six, and oil for the light. Oil for the light. And brother, he made the candlestick down there in verse number 11. Everything was overlaid with gold. And the candlestick there, he, it, would, uh, it had those, uh, those seven little prongs sticking up. Have you ever read about the candlestick? It's got three little arms going up this way. Three little arms going up this way, one up the middle, making a total of seven. Did you know that's a picture of the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is pictured as the sevenfold Spirit in your Bible. Do you notice that? Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Hold, uh, hold your finger there in Isaiah chapter 11. We'll go back to Exodus. Uh, we'll go right along here. Isaiah chapter number 11. And let's look at why the candlestick had seven prongs on it there, representing the Holy Ghost. We know that there's only one Spirit of God. We know that there's only one Holy Spirit. But it's represented here, at seven representations of that one Spirit. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 2. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. Here it is. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. One. The Spirit of wisdom. Two. And understanding. Three. The counsel. Four. My. Five. Spirit of knowledge, six. And of the fear of the Lord, seven. There's the sevenfold Spirit of God. You say, Brother Danny, you reckon that Scripture really means it's sevenfold? Revelation. Turn your Bible to Revelation. I'll, uh, I'll show you where that sews it up. Revelation chapter number 1, and look at what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 1, when the Apostle John was writing here on the Isle of Patmos, inspired by the Holy Ghost, Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number, let's see, what is it? Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and you in peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, capital S. See that? Now, there's only one Holy Spirit that is represented in sevenfold, as it tells you in Isaiah 11, 2. Wisdom, counsel, understanding, fear of the Lord, and all of those representations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to shine light on the Word of God. If you'll get down in your Bible study room and read that Bible with the right kind of heart, the Holy Ghost will illuminate it for you. I believe in commentaries. I believe in listening to what men have to say. I believe in reading. I believe you'd be a fool to ignore uh, thousands of hours of study by great men. But when it really comes right down to it, you get your Bible down, pray, ask God to show you something until the light shines on that thing and it gets real and them words jump up off them pages and get in your heart and burn and show you what God wants you to know. Amen? That's why the Bible said, His words are lamp unto my feet 
and a light unto my path. Daniel, come in. They said, none of these guys can read that. Can you read it? And he said, yep. They said, all right, you better tell us what it says. And he said, Mm-mm, you ain't going to want to hear this. They said, tell me the truth. He said, you want me to preach it just like it is? He said, yes, sir. Tell me what it is. He said, all right, son. It's heavy, heavy. Hang over your head, King. You in trouble. Come on, man. Quit being around the bush. He said, many, many. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tickle, you parson, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And your kingdom's going to be taken from you and given to the Medes and the Persians. Buddy, he walked, turned right around, walked out of there, and every head bowed and every eye shut, buddy. And in a few minutes, the Medes and Persians came in there and took the kingdom. And in that night, Belshazzar was slain because them fingers wrote him a message. When the finger of God writes you a message, if you believe it and accept it, it'll bless you. And if you reject it, it'll destroy you. One more, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This is a well-known story of the finger of God. John chapter number 8. This is a story when they brought the woman in the act of adultery to the Lord Jesus Christ. God in the flesh walked responded to it. John chapter number 8. The Bible said in verse number 3. John chapter 8 and verse 3. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him. See, you got to watch it when they come around asking a question, tempting the Lord. They don't want to stri- They don't. They don't really want an answer. They're trying to trip him up and trick him, and that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. Here it is, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, twice he did it. He stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Brother, here's one of the great stories where the fingers of God does some more writing. And look at the response of man. We, uh, we see this story. They come dragging in this woman one day. Notice, this bunch of religious hypocrites. They wasn't meant more right with God than nothing. They didn't care nothing about the woman or him. They was just trying to trip him up. So they come dragging this woman. That you say, how do you know that? Because where's the man? If they caught that woman in the act of adultery, there was a man let him go. The Bible, Moses said, the adultery and the adultery shall be put to death. They should have brought both of them. Some of them guys back in them days had some practices they didn't want to be known out in the open, so they just killed the women. And that's for all time and eternity. When a girl gets pregnant, she's talked about like a dog, and nobody says anything about the boy. But he's just as guilty as she is, and most of the time worse. Say amen right there. Amen. Amen. And buddy, I'll tell you what. They just brought the woman in there and said, What do you want us to do with this old scum here? And the Lord didn't say a word, and he just knelt down like this and started going. Now come them fingers. Them same fingers that wrote them Ten Commandments. And same fingers that popped up on that wall back there in the book of Daniel. He decided he'd write something else. So he wrote that story there. And they kept on asking him. He raised up again. And he wrote down and wrote the second verse there. And he said, uh, Whichever one of you guys ain't got no sin in you, you throw the first rock at her. And there's such conviction around our buddy. They looked down. I don't know what he wrote. 
I've heard it, I'm going to tell you what I've heard people say in just a second. I don't know what he wrote, but whatever it was. Oh, my soul. It didn't take much of it to do that crowd. That's where a lot of people are today. It don't take much Bible for them. They only come to church once every two months. So it don't, it, they got a small stomach spiritually. One, one dose about every six months does them for a long time. I don't know enough preaching for a while. Yeah, I know you have. It loaded your whole wagon too, didn't it? This little sermon right here helped these old fellas right out. Just like somebody said, I've heard preachers speculate ever since I've been saved about this, and I don't reckon nobody, unless God showed them somehow, really knows what he wrote. I've heard people say that he wrote all their sins. I've heard people say, well, when he got down there, he wrote lying, covetousness, being cruel to your wife, not keeping up your family, you cheated, stole. Boy, ever he wrote down every one of them sin, and they looked at it and got under conviction, and the eldest of the other went out walking out one at a time. Now, it may be, I don't know, I've heard people say that. I've heard, I've heard other people say that he wrote the Ten Commandments. I've heard people say, I believe the Lord wrote down there and those same fingers wrote, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And now if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. You guys done that? Now, I've heard he wrote stuff like that. I don't know. I've heard he wrote all of their sins. I've heard he wrote all of their, their, uh, their, uh, co the commandments against them. I've heard he wrote different things in the law. But I'll tell you what, the best one I heard, what old brother Mays Jackson, I've heard him say on the radio, I like it good as anyone I've ever heard. And I, since I don't know what he wrote, and since you don't know what he wrote, I'll just say, let's say that's what he wrote, because I don't know. It sure does sound good. I, I, that May said that he got down that first time, and when he swept down there, that he wrote justice called. And boy, he wrote down there like that. And they got another. They thought justice called. And boy, that old woman looked down there and she realized that she deserved to go to hell. She realized that she should be stoned in the law. In the law of Moses, that woman should have lost her life. And brother, she looked and she got crying. And she got to worrying about it. And they asked her again. But thank God, brother May said that he got down the second time and wrote, but mercy answered. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah! Boy, that sounds good enough to me! Amen! The law condemned, but grace comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And He said, but mercy answered. Go home, woman! You're forgiven! Sin no more! You're washed! You're clean! You're sanctified! I don't know what He wrote, but that sounds good enough to me. Amen! Justice called. Hey, the other day I was telling them down that revival, and I thought of it this evening when I was studying the other day, Corey. No, I don't know where she's at. Where's she at? That ain't Corey. Oh, oh, she conked out. She's meditating, praying for me while I'm preaching. Huh? Well, Chris is over here awake. Sometimes when I glance at them up here, I can't tell one from the other. But did you know what? The other day she had uh, my wife down, and she had her down like this, tickling her. Boy, she held, she does that to her. They play a lot. And she had my wife down like that and had her hand pinned down and she was tickling, tickling. And, and Laurie was saying, Oh, Corey, no, oh, Corey, no, oh, Corey, no, like that, you know. And Corey was doing like that, just, it was really thrilling her to tickle her. Boy, she had her down there just playing, having a good time. And she's a tickling her real big, you know, and tickling her. And, and Laurie said, Quit, Corey, quit. And she said, You gotta say the magic word. You gotta say the magic word. She said, What is the magic word? I was sitting over here listening to him. She said, You gotta say the magic word. She said, what is a magic word? She said, it starts with M. It starts with M. And she said, I don't know what it is, Corey. What is it? And she said, it ends with Ursi. Amen. <laughs> It ends with mercy, amen. And I looked around and said, Woo, glory to God. That's what we say to the Lord. Brother, when we come, thank God the magic word. It starts with him and it ends with mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. Mercy. Mercy. I'm glad one day when I come to God as a sinner, as an 18 year old boy, just as call. But thank God, mercy answered. And I'm saved tonight by the mercy of God. Man wrote what God, man wrote what he didn't like about God, and it does no good. But when God writes something, brother, it's got power behind it. Notice the response of man to what God wrote. Moses broke it. Belshazzar couldn't understand it. Pharaoh despised it. Jehudi cut it up. 
over there in Jeremiah 36 where he, he wrote dread two or three pages and cut it up and put it in the fireplace. And God inspired another set and added a bunch more words and all of them was inspired and they wasn't the original. The people in Jesus' day trampled it under their feet. Now, if you'll think with me for a minute in closing, that's the same response that people have toward the Word of God today. That's how you know that King James Bible, the Word of God. The same response today. Listen, Moses broke it. Do you know anybody that treats the Word of God like that? Just everything it says, they do the opposite. Belshazzar couldn't understand it. You ever heard anybody say, I just can't understand that old King James Bible. That's because it's the Word of God and you can't understand it until the Spirit of God gets in you. It ain't got nothing to do with your education. Amen? I don't care if you didn't go to the second grade, you can get something out of that book when the Holy Spirit opened your eyes. Pharaoh despised it. Proverbs 13 says, 13, 13, matter of fact, he that despised the word shall be destroyed. Jehudi cut it up. That's the translators. And the people in Jesus' day trample it under their feet. But it still lives on because God's fingers wrote it. Let's stand and bow our heads for prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank God for His Word. The fingers of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for Thy Word tonight. Thy Word is truth. I pray tonight there's someone here who, Lord, is not ready to meet You, not living for You, not serving You. Maybe they're saved, but they're not living right. God, may this be the night they fall in love with You, fall out with sin, and get their life right with You. I ask You, Lord, to move in this invitation. Thank You for a wonderful service here tonight, the good singing, the good fellowship. Thank You, Lord, for the Spirit of God who's shown light, a candlestick against the Word of God tonight. Do what ought to be done in our services tonight. If there's one here tonight who don't know You, convict them and draw them to Jesus. We'll praise You and thank You for it in Jesus' name.